I want to talk today about Ronald Reagan, uh, the evil empire, which is a phrase he uses, which is very controversial in its time, a phrase he himself disavows at the end of his presidency. We'll talk about that. But it's crucial to understanding the way he thinks about foreign policy, as well as some of domestic policy during his presidency. It's also crucial to understanding the controversies around Reagan and also understanding how Reagan is often misunderstood. And in today's lecture, uh, I am not going to present Reagan as a hero or a villain. Uh, there are villains in the world. One is named Vladimir Putin. Uh, and there are sometimes heroes. Maybe maybe the uh, Volodymyr uh, Zelensky in Ukraine is proving to be a, a hero. But, but this is not, not going to be a lecture about Reagan as hero or Reagan as villain. It's going to be a lecture about Reagan as president seeking to pursue a stronger anti-communist foreign policy an anti-communist foreign policy that had positive and negative consequences, that did some good in some areas and some bad in some others, and that remains controversial. And we're going to understand what he meant when he called the Soviet Union an evil empire and why that speech became so iconic in its time and remains so uh, for us today. It asks one of the fundamental questions, this lecture and the, the topic, the primary document today, uh, what does it mean? What is it appropriate in calling out an adversary? What is effective? How do we balance the need for moral rectitude with diplomatic engagement? I will argue today that although Reagan took a very strong stand against the Soviet Union, as we see in his evil empire speech, he also was willing to reach out to negotiate to pursue diplomacy. And that that diplomatic element, the desire to negotiate, to build peace, even to compromise, even with a regime he felt was at times an evil empire, that it was the negotiating impulse it was the impulse to diplomacy that was crucial in providing opportunities to uh, uh, encourage Mikhail Gorbachev to reform the Soviet Union and bring an end to the Cold War. That Mikhail Gorbachev did more of the work, but Reagan did play an important role. Reagan did not end the Cold War, and he did not end it by being a tough guy, though his toughness was important. He ended it actually through negotiation, through diplomacy, through, through relationship building of one kind or another. And that is relevant for us today, because part of what we're seeing from NATO, from the United States, seeing from with Democrats and Republicans is a very strong reaction to the conquest, aggression, and atrocities committed by Russia. But it's also important that diplomacy remains on the table. Uh, as we contain, deter, push back Russian aggression, we hope, we also have to continue talking. And diplomacy is absolutely crucial in the way we manage our alliance. One of the most successful things I think that's happened in the last six months, six months is that the United States has been able to rebuild and improve upon many of its alliances that had fallen into disrepair. And we've been able to work very cooperatively with the Germans in particular, the French, the British, the Japanese and others in responding to Vladimir Putin. And there's even more of that going on behind the scenes than we see. So, so diplomacy is crucial to this story as well. Okay. So let's get started with a little bit. Uh, I, I like to start with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, it's sort of where the lecture ends also, but I like to start there because, you know, I, I was in high school when this happened, uh, 1989, I was a junior in high school. And, and I always like to share with students that uh, when I was finishing high school, the world was just opening up. It really felt like it was a moment of liberation. Anything was possible, people power, people power. The people no longer wanted communism and they were able to tear it down. We really had an extraordinary sense of idealism in those days. I went off to college thinking we were going to solve every problem. I bring that up to contrast that with the experience I know my undergraduates have had. Many of my undergraduates are freshmen, so that means they're the same age as my daughter, and I know they didn't really have a senior year of high school. They lost out on so much. Even if they were zooming in for school, they were missing out on all the social activities, things like that. You all know this better than, than I do. Uh, we did a podcast with a, a, a local teacher a few weeks ago, and uh, Mr. Flowers commented on some students thriving in this environment and other students falling behind and his uncertainty whether they would ever, ever catch up. Uh, different generations grow up in different countries. That's the point here. And different presidents become president in different countries. Even though it's the same country in name, it's a different place now than it was then. Not necessarily worse, not necessarily better, but different. Different. Uh, Reagan uh, was part of this story uh, in complex ways. The re one of the reasons we study history is to understand complexity. 
to understand the complex dynamics behind change, the unintended consequences of people's behavior, the interactions between different people, and, and this will be a key theme of today's lecture, the ability of people to change. The ability of people to change. When Reagan was elected president in 1980, he was promising what Time Magazine says in this cover, a fresh start. The country was coming out of a period in the 1970s of very high interest rates, some of you might remember, oil crises, energy crises, uh, foreign wars that were not going well, foreign conflicts. Uh, one of my first memories as a child is watching with my parents, uh, a young Ted couple, every night on the evening news recount um, another day that the Americans were being held hostage in Tehran. For 444 days, embassy personnel from the U.S. Embassy in Tehran were held hostage. And it was, it was demoralizing. It was demeaning for the United States. There was nothing we could do about it. We tried to rescue them by helicopter, and the helicopters crashed in the desert. They never even made their way uh, to Tehran. It, it was a demoralizing time, uh, a time of malaise, famously the name taken from one of Jimmy Carter's speeches. And Reagan was promising, this actor from California, this optimist from California, was promising a fresh start. In four years, he would talk about a new morning in America. That this was going to be a new start for America, a new morning uh, for, for the country. I'm going to just uh, talk, and we don't have that much time, so I'm going to go through these quickly, but as I narrate the 1980s and the context for this speech that we're then going to talk about in the primary document section, uh, we're going to go through a, a bunch of key points here. And again, we'll go through them quickly. We can come back to them for Q&A uh, if you want. We're going to talk about Reagan and the new right. What is this new right? Uh, it's not the same as the Trump Republicans, but you could argue it's, 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 a, it's an origin. It's an earlier cousin, distant cousin of what we see today. And the distant cousin was very different from what we see today, but there still is a relationship there. Uh, we can talk about Reagan and the new Cold War. How did the Cold War change during this period? Uh, and then I want us to talk a bit about the Gorbachev generation, what happens in the Soviet Union, how Gorbachev's program changes as Reagan is pursuing his program, and, and how these two intersect. That's what we study as historians, as, as historians, as different lives, how different lives, societies, how different issues intersect with one another. And we're gonna be looking at that intersection today and the speech that we'll talk about in the primary document section is a, is a form or is a kind and insight into that uh, intersection. So there's a little background on uh, Ronald Reagan. Many of you know this, but it's worth going back through it and mostly our students don't know it. So Ronald Reagan grew up in Dixon, Illinois in a small town, a farming town uh, in Illinois. His father was not a farmer. His father was a shoe salesman. And as I have to explain to my students, shoe salesmen at that time in the 1930s actually went door to door selling shoes. They didn't stay in it. They didn't have high tops that they sold in a fancy footlocker at a glitzy mall. Uh, they went door to door selling shoes. Reagan's father was well known, well respected. He was a kind of town uh, personality of a sort. Uh, and he liked to, to drink also. He was of Irish extraction. During the Great Depression, his father lost his job. This, this shocks my students that people stopped buying shoes. People literally stopped buying shoes. They couldn't afford them in Dixon, Illinois. Uh, I've had students very earnestly ask me, well, then how did they play basketball if they couldn't get new Nike high tops? Um, they, they, they didn't play basketball and they didn't wear shoes or they didn't buy new shoes at the very least. Reagan's father's unemployed for about a year and it's a very common story that you've seen and I'm sure shared with your students that the Great Depression was a Great Depression, not just because of the economic effects, but because of the social effects of unemployment on so many people. The vast majority of American families were single wage earner families. Men defined their masculinity then, and they still to some extent do, but certainly then by being so-called breadwinners. People don't use that phrase anymore. My students don't use that phrase. It's a common phrase in the 30s and 40s, breadwinners. The men were supposed to be men because they were out earning a wage. And if they couldn't earn a wage, they weren't men. They weren't real men. Um, Reagan's father fell into that uh, depressive uh, psychology and psychosis. And Reagan describes this in his memoir. Uh, Reagan's hero was Franklin Roosevelt and remained so to the end of his career. Uh, at the end of Reagan's presidency, he goes up to FDR's presidential library to the old FDR home and he says that FDR taught him everything he knows about politics. Uh, he listened to FDR on the radio. He was enthralled by the hope that FDR was able to bring 
uh, and FDR got his dad a job. Uh, Jack Reagan uh, worked as, and it's ironic considering um, just about 30 years later, there'll be another president who did this. Uh, Jack Reagan worked as a community organizer. He was hired by the WPA and the CWA, two alphabet agencies of the, in the New Deal, Civilian Works Administration, the Works Progress Administration, to take federal grants and invest them in community activities. Uh, he was the right person to do this because as the shoe salesman in town, he knew he knew the town. Reagan grows up in this context. He goes to Eureka College, which is a nearby college, uh, Church of Disciples of Christ. Um, and then he decides that he is going to make his way in radio like Franklin Roosevelt. And the image we have here is of Reagan as a radio announcer in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, for WHO radio. He was a sports announcer, and many of you have probably seen him tell this story on video. Uh, he wasn't at the games, and they didn't have the internet then, obviously. Students have to be reminded of that, of course. Uh, he would get a telex, uh, tel kind of telex teletype, telling him what was going on in Chicago uh, Cubs games, and he would have to narrate it. So he became a storyteller at a very young, at a very young age. He decided that he was going to go make his way in California and become a movie star. He did not become a A-grade movie star. He was never a Lauren Bacall or a Jimmy Stewart, but he was a B-grade movie star. Um, he was kind of like a Stanley Tucci today. Uh, maybe Stanley Tucci is an A-grade. So I don't know. I don't know who the B-grade -grade, B -grade movie He was a recognizable figure to those in the 40s and 50s. And he also made war propaganda films for the U.S. government. He was a recognizable figure, but not the star of stars. But he did reasonably well. Uh, for himself. And before I go ahead, it's important to understand that his shift, his political shift, how he becomes a Republican, how he goes from an FDR Democrat to becoming a, uh, well, what we would say, Reagan Republican, right? Uh, and some of this happens really during Barry Goldwater's run for presidency in 1964. Um, and what really motivates a lot of this for Reagan is a belief that the New Deal programs that had helped his family were now in their second iteration getting too big and that they were crowding out the individualism. If FDR protected families and individuals, Reagan believed that the second generation of programs were programs that were now actually getting too involved in people's lives. He also, as he made more money, as he became actually quite wealthy in California, he didn't like the idea of paying high taxes. He is part of a large group. Uh, it is really the crucial group of 1970s Republicans who changed the party, who are Midwesterners like himself transplanted to California. It's hard to believe, but California was the heart of the Republican Party, Orange County, the heart of the heart of the Republican Party in the 1960s and 70s. And it's on the basis of that shift, these Midwesterners who were FDR Democrats, whose parents were working class people who moved to California, who have become professionals, who make more money, who like government, but think government's too involved in their lives and don't wanna pay taxes, uh, how they move to the Republican Party and become the defining element uh, of the Republican Party. Uh, David Greenberg talked a little bit about this with Nixon. It's part of the Nixon story. Uh, and Nixon is an early mentor in some ways to Reagan, though Reagan is a very different kind of politician. He's a politician of hope. When he becomes president, one of his key points in his election run and in, in getting elected is that the United States must be stronger in fighting communism. He hates communism. And he hates communism because of his experience in California. Reagan was the head of the Screen Actors Guild, which is actually the union for actors. And just like in baseball, in the 1950s, actors also had no freedom to choose which studio they worked for. If you were hired by a studio for your first movie, hired by Warner Brothers, hired by RKO, you, they owned you. In the same way the Yankees owned Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth couldn't say, once the Red Sox sold him to the Yankees, he couldn't say, sorry, I'm going to leave. Mickey Mantle was owned by the Yankees. Joe DiMaggio was owned by the Yankees. Your students will notice, if they pay attention to this, if they, these old sports heroes, they all played their entire careers for one team. Just as the actors of the 1950s generally were with the same studio time and again. And this kept their wages down. If you can't go somewhere else to work, you can't negotiate to get paid more. Reagan was a pioneer through the Screen Actors Guild in arguing as a labor leader on behalf of actors, on behalf of their freedom to be 
able to move from studio to studio. And just as baseball developed free agency in the 1960s and the late 50s, studios, Hollywood developed free agency. And that's what allows actors to get paid so much more money today because they can get offered roles from multiple studios and then they can say, I'll take the role from the studio that pays me the most. And they can negotiate, they have leverage, they have leverage. Reagan hated communists because the communists in Hollywood, and they were very few, but communists or even socialists were against this system. They wanted all resources to be relatively equally shared. Reagan wanted a capitalist system where those like himself who were desirable for many films could get paid more money. Communism undermined that, right? Communism was more about everyone. And these were some people arguing this in Hollywood, all actors should get paid the same. All baseball players should get paid the same. Um, he also believed that communists were infiltrating Hollywood. Uh, during the McCarthy Act period, he had turned over and named names and people like Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall never forgave him for that, uh, by the way. Communism was an evil. And one of his selling points as a candidate was that Jimmy Carter was too weak he, who believed in American ideals, this Midwestern boy turned Californian, was going to return us to who we are and get the communists, stop them from limiting our power as a society, stop overbuilding the US government, invest instead in fighting communism abroad and any communist influences within our society. And he begins doing this in particular in our own backyard, the Reagan Doctrine, as it's called, is a doctrine that says the United States will use its force wherever it can in Central America to support anti-communist governments, anti-communist governments. What this creates, and this is condemned by many people at the time, uh, is it creates a scenario where the United States is actually supporting a lot of dictators. Uh, I love this cartoon, right? See President Duarte. Duarte was the uh, thuggish president of El Salvador, anti-communist, but a major violator of human rights. See President Duarte, you can tell him in Washington that El Salvador continues to move steadily toward democracy. It was not moving toward democracy, but it was fighting against a communist insurgency or communist parties that sought to come to power. Nicaragua and the Sandinista regime is another example of this. And much of the trouble Reagan later gets into with Iran-Contra is about trying to send weapons to these dictatorial, anti-democratic, but also anti-communist regimes in spite of congressional prohibitions on that. From prohibitions placed on his ability to do that by Democrats in, in, in Congress. Uh, and to this day, if you talk to scholars of Central and Latin America, people who see that region as their main area of study or their area of home and origin, Reagan is not seen as, as a great hero. The exception to that is Cuba. But outside of Cuba, uh, he's not seen. He's not seen as, as a great hero. Um, he also, um, in spite of his anti-government um, statements, his belief in not letting government get too big, he is responsible for the largest growth in the American uh, debt since World War II. And, and part of that is his investing in the military Part of that is also his investing in FDR's old programs, particularly Social Security, which gets indexed, which means it starts to automatically grow uh, along with inflation. It gets indexed to inflation, which in the short run doesn't cost money, but in the long run it does. That's today one of the challenges Social Security has as, a, as our population ages. It's more expensive for an aging and long living population to be supported uh, through this system. Part of the deal Reagan makes with the Democrats is that they will let him um, cut taxes, as he promises that he will, uh, but that they'll actually increase spending at the same time. And Reagan, in a sense, wants that too. He wants to spend on the military. Uh, he particularly wants to build the largest Navy the United States has ever had, a 600-ship Navy. He wants to invest more money in new nuclear systems, all sorts of issues uh, along those lines. And that's the context for the speech that we're gonna talk about in more detail. It's a really important speech, one of the most important speeches of his presidency. It's written by speechwriter Anthony Dolan, uh, but it's also heavily edited by Reagan himself. Uh, he used to take out a black pen before he would speak and edit uh, speeches. You can find the edited versions in the Reagan library. Some of them are available to be seen online. And this speech in 1983 really sums up what he thinks his presidency is about. 
he's courting evangelicals. He's the first president to really court evangelicals in this way. And he's doing this at the National uh, Association of Evangelicals, their conference, their convention in Orlando, Florida on the 8th of March, 1983. And, and if you read this speech, you'll see he begins by actually talking about an issue that was not a political issue to this time, abortion. Reagan, by the way, in, before he became president, was a believer, was a, was a pro-choice person. He was not anti-Roe v. Wade. Um, but he makes an appeal to those who oppose abortion rights as a way of appealing to those he sees as conservative religious evangelicals and to try to pull them his way. He also argues for prayer in school. Um, again, an issue. He was not a, a very a frequently praying man. He did not frequently go to church. He's actually the first president uh, who was divorced. Uh, so in many ways, he doesn't fit. Uh, and this will be a theme in American history. The, the politicians who often make the most appeal to religious groups are not necessarily the most religious themselves. Some of the least appealing to religious groups are the most personally religious. Think about someone like Jimmy Carter or even Joe Biden to some extent. Uh, in that context. Reagan makes the argument also in this speech that politics of hope means politics of morality. And that means we must use our moral suasion, our power as a society to call out evil in the world. He cites C.S. Lewis in the screw tape, tape, uh, screw tape letters and famously and controversially says that the Soviet Union is not just another power, not just a rival. But uh, it is, quote, the focus of evil in the modern world. He says, uh, one of the famous paragraphs toward the, end of this, toward the end of the speech, let us pray for the salvation of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all people on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. And then he calls on all quiet men, a derivation of Nixon's silent majority of all quiet men. Zachary, are you a quiet man right now? No. He's not quiet because I just asked him as he was walking by. Uh, he, he calls out all quiet men to quote, raise their voices, raise their voices about the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. And this is red meat for evangelicals at the time. What Reagan is doing is saying that his hopeful politics is also a politics of motivating people to call out what he sees as the threat of excessive state power, the threat of communism uh, in our world. And in some ways, this works for Reagan. His first two years as president, he's actually very unpopular. The United States still has high inflation and high unemployment. 1982, unemployment is more than 10%. Um, so in fact, he has some early troubles, but he is able to motivate people. And as the economy turns around in his third year, um, and he uses the strong rhetoric, there's a sense in the country for a while that he's giving us some purpose, some focus, and Soviet, uh, the Soviet activities in Afghanistan and elsewhere seem to provide evidence of what he's calling the evils uh, of their behavior. And he highlights the repression of Jews in the Soviet Union. He highlights the repression of religious figures. He highlights the uh, horrors of Soviet, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, during this period. Also, the highlights, high, he highlights the Soviet repression of uh, the Polish Workers Union at the time, known as Solidarity, and its leader, Lech Walesa, who will later become a hero of the democratic movement um, in, in Poland. And the 1984 Olympics, we've just been to the Beijing Olympics, right? the 1984 Olympics are really interesting. They were held in Los Angeles. The Soviets did not come because the United States did not go to the 1980 Olympics after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. So the Soviets didn't come to the Los Angeles Olympics. And it turned out to be a great thing uh, because the United States won like all the gold medals. I, I had a summer job then. I was in, um, gosh, to middle school, but I had a summer job. And um, McDonald's was offering these little cards. You get a card when you bought a Big Mac um, for an event. And if the US won the gold in the event, you got a Big Mac. If they won the silver, you got fries. And if they won uh, the bronze, you got um, uh, a, a drink. I, I had free McDonald's all summer. It was not the healthiest summer at all because the United States was winning all of these medals. It was great. There was a sense of patriotic purpose. But there was also a problem in this for Reagan. 
as his popularity grew on the right, he also confronted uh, some people who were now really concerned that he was going too far. And when they did polling for his reelection in 1984, his pollsters found that some people thought he was a madman. There was a major nuclear freeze movement at the time, people who wanted to stop the building of nuclear weapons of all kinds. And there was concern that Reagan uh, was going too far. He took that seriously. He was shocked, he said to one of his advisors, that people would think he really wanted to start a war. He was talking tough to remind Americans about who we are, to call out evil. But that didn't mean he wanted to go to nuclear war with evil. But you could see from the speech how people would get that impression. So in reaction to that, and because he had to be reelected, Reagan begins to shift in 1984. He continues to hate communism, but he begins to talk about actually reaching out to the communists, reaching out for negotiations. He gives a famous speech as State of the Union in 1984, where he says that, uh, he writes this in by hand at the last minute. It's a classic Reagan story. If Ivan and Anya in Russia met John and Sally in Iowa, they would get along. Why can't we get along? He's asked during the, during the debates with Walter Mondale um, why he hasn't negotiated more of the Soviet Union. And Reagan had a good sense of humor. To be an effective leader, you need to have a sense of humor. Reagan said, um, I would love uh, to negotiate with them if they didn't just keep dying on me. Three Soviet leaders died on Reagan within a matter of three years. Uh, Leonid Brezhnev, um, Yuri Andropov, and Konstantin Chernyenko. Reagan was fortunate. Always good to be lucky that they were followed by this man, Mikhail Gorbachev. Basically, the old guard was dying off in the Soviet Union. The old guard, you all remember these images above the Kremlin, right, of these old doddering men, the old revolutionaries. Uh, one of them, when Chernyenko was a premier, he, he, he was so old that, and so sick that he would like skip a page in his speech when he was reading a speech and not even notice that he had skipped a page. Um, they are succeeded by this man, Mikhail Gorbachev, who's of a new generation. And that really changes everything. Um, Gorbachev comes from, uh, not from Moscow, he comes from an area right near Ukraine, right near Crimea in southwestern Russia called Stavropol. It's an area that was devastated by Stalin, a very poor area. And uh, he is a communist, a believer in the system, but he's a believer that the system needs to be reformed. Gorbachev's perspective is that communism is good, but it has been mismanaged, especially by the generation of leaders around Leonid Brezhnev and others. And he is going as the young tyke, he's going to reform the system. In order to reform the system, however, Gorbachev needs more resources. And so what he wants to do is actually limit the spending on the military for domestic reasons. He wants to limit the spending on the military. So he goes through three phases. Uh, we can learn a little Russian today. Uh, he begins in his first year with what is known in Russian as Uskarenya, uh, which is acceleration. Uh, that's getting the corruption out. He tries to ban vodka sales because Russia has a problem with public drunkenness and private drunkenness. There's a problem with drunkenness across all areas. Uh, it's a disaster. Because uh, when people can't buy vodka, they start making vodka in their bathtubs, and then they start dying. I always tell my undergraduates, uh, you shouldn't drink too heavily, you shouldn't really drink at all if you're underage. But if you're going to drink, don't drink stuff you made. Don't make your alcohol yourself. It will not work out well. It will not, and never let anyone pour punch, some kind of mystery punch for you that you have not, I don't know what's in it. Um, Gorbachev's effort to get out the corruption doesn't reform the system. So then what he does is he goes to glasnost, to openness, to open the system, to put new, more effective young people like himself in charge, and to expose those who are not running the system well. Once things are exposed, though, you see more of the problems. You see the way the system is inefficiently giving resources. You see how certain people are hoarding the resources. So then he goes to perestroika, to restructuring the system. All the while, each of these phases requires more peaceful relations with the United States because he needs resources that would go to the military to be invested at home. And Gorbachev had traveled widely, unlike his predecessors. And what he really wanted to do was make the Soviet Union in some ways into Sweden. He was very taken with the Scandinavian model, which was more socialist than American capitalism, uh, but also more productive 
than what the Soviet Union had produced had, uh, over the 60 years of its history uh, to that uh, to that time. Now it's very important um, as we as we go forward here toward the end, right? Um, Reagan doesn't initially believe that the evil empire is no longer evil because Gorbachev is in charge. That's not what happens. He still thinks in 1985 when Gorbachev takes over, it's an evil empire. But Reagan comes to believe that Gorbachev and many of the Russian people are good people who he can work with. And this is despite his advisors. This is where I think Reagan deserves praise. I've shown where he deserves criticism. Here's where he deserves praise. And it's not for saying evil empire. It's for saying they're an evil empire, but still being open-minded enough to see that that didn't mean that all their leaders were evil. He sees in Gorbachev, he believes, someone who can be a partner. Margaret Thatcher says this first, the British leader. She, he's someone we can work with. Reagan put a lot of store in personal relations and personal impressions. And I can't say this strongly enough. The historical record shows that personal impressions matter enormously. That's why my grandmother right, always told me, uh, even if you're getting the mail, just the mail, going outside, make sure you're well-dressed. You never know who you're going to see. She would, my grandmother would dress up before she went to the mailbox uh, because you never know who you're going to see. First impressions matter. Don't have them see you in your bedroom slippers and your uh, bathrobe. I, I had not followed that advice. And I probably embarrass my family when people see me in my bathrobe, get a newspaper in the morning. Uh, uh, but, but the point here is, personal impressions, personal relations matter. Reagan is surrounded by advisors, including Robert Gates, who's then the head of the CIA, later becomes a very distinguished Secretary of Defense. Robert Gates tells him, Gorbachev is the wolf in sheep's clothing. Don't, don't think that you can do something with him. But Reagan sees in Gorbachev a, free, a freer thinker, a reformer, someone he can do business with, someone he's eager to do business with. And in 1986, a few years before this photo is taken here, they meet in Reykjavik and they actually talk about eliminating nuclear weapons, just eliminating them all. And you can see pictures of um, Soviet, uh, excuse me, of, of American advisors outside the room in Reykjavik, it's, it's glass doors, where Gorbachev and Reagan are meeting in front of the fireplace and like you know, their faces are on the window. No, don't do it, right? Ray Reagan is going well beyond his advisors. Part of it is that he, he has self-confidence, but he's also, he's not an expert. He's willing to try different things. There's an advantage in that uh, sometimes. And he and Gorbachev do in some, some ways things that no one thought were possible. They eliminate a whole class of weapons, intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe in 1986 and 87. These are exactly the weapons that Vladimir Putin, by the way, wants to put back into Ukraine so he can use them to threaten the West. Uh, and they make moves to bring these two societies together. I, I don't think Reagan and Gorbachev thought they were ending the Cold War, but they did. They did. This relationship did. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you exactly what it did. You will learn today exactly when the Cold War ended. And that's what this photo is about. So this is from December 1988. Um, and this is when uh, Gorbachev visited New York. I think his second visit to New York to the United Nations. It might have even been his third visit to the United Nations. Now that I think about it. And it's December 1988. He's coming to the United Nations. Reagan is at the last month, two months of his term, second term as president. And his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, there to the right, uh, who's been his vice president through his entire presidency, has now been elected president. So you have the outgoing president, the incoming president, and the Soviet leader all here. This is on Governor's Island off the southern tip of Manhattan. That's the Statue of Liberty in the background, obviously. Gorbachev, just before this photo, has gone to the United Nations and he's done the unthinkable. He has promised that because the United States and the Soviet Union have established a more trusting relationship, and now they're moving faster and faster, and he wants to move even faster, he's going to unilaterally take 500,000 forces out of Europe. Think of it this way, Gorbachev takes the Russian forces out of Europe, Vladimir Putin is trying to put them back in. It's really a reversal of this moment. After doing that, Gorbachev goes to, to Governor's Island to meet with his friend, Ron, and the incoming President Bush, who he doesn't know quite as well. And the transcript of this meeting is available, December of 1988. And if you read it from Mars, you would think Ronnie and Mikhail were old pals. Uh, Ronnie says, you know, I want to make sure all this progress continues when I'm gone. Mikhail says, yes, please tell George that. Please make sure this continues. 
they, they, they talk as good friends. After this meeting, uh, Gorbachev gets into uh, one of his Ziel limousines, as they're called, these big black limousines. They were like big boxes. Uh, he travels with them. And there are three of these limousines, and they're driving up uh, north in Manhattan, up Lexington Avenue. I was in high school in New York City then. I'm coming out of the subway at 59th Street and Lexington Avenue. It's a Thursday, it's 3.30, 4 o'clock, just, you know, like your kids, normal kids go home on a bus or they walk. In New York City, we take the subway. So I'm coming up out of the subway and I notice on the street on Lexington Avenue, Midtown Manhattan, are all these people out, all these people out. And they're wearing ties. These are not bums. They're outside. I'm like, what happened? Did the Yankees win the World Series again? But how? It's December, right? Did they get a special victory? I mean, it's really nice. The Yankees get to win the World Series even when there's not a World Series. What's going on here? Um, I'm standing. I've got my backpack on. I'm standing. And these Zill limousines come by. They stop. And uh, the guy with the thing on his head, Gorbachev, gets out of the limousine. And it's like Bruce Springsteen is in front of us. Right? Everyone, all these Americans in suits, are struggling to touch him and see him. Um, he walks in my direction. And uh, he says, Jeremy. No, he doesn't. He didn't know my name. He didn't know who I was. Uh, and in fact, I did get to shake his hand, but I barely got to do anything more than that because he was so swamped by Americans. Uh, he was a celebrity and he was beloved as the Soviet leader who was finally reforming the system. Ladies and gentlemen, that is when the Cold War ended. Not when the Soviet Union was no longer, quote unquote, the evil empire, but when we no longer feared them. And when people no longer feared them. The opposite of what Vladimir Putin wants today. That's a, a little less than a year before the wall comes down. Why does the wall come down the next year? Because the citizens, the young people of East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, they no longer fear the big bad Soviet Union. They knew what I saw, which was that this man was still a communist, but he wasn't Stalin. He wasn't going to send the tanks in, and he didn't. In 56, Khrushchev sent the tanks in. In 68, Brezhnev sent the tanks in. Gorbachev wouldn't send the tanks in. You cannot have a Cold War when you do not fear your adversary. You cannot have a Cold War when you do not fear your adversary. Now, for Vladimir Putin, that's a disaster. Because without fear, the Soviet Union was unable to hold on to its empire. So what is he doing today? He's trying to create fear again. When Reagan said the Soviet Union was an evil empire, he meant that communism encouraged what he thought were evil, aggressive actions, and that Soviet leaders had pursued that. But he was willing to see and we didn't understand that in the speech at the time. He might not have even understood that. He was willing to see that an evil empire would not always be evil. That doesn't mean he ever felt he was wrong in his hatred of communism. But it does mean, as he said in 1988, when he visited Moscow, that when he called them an evil empire in 83, now in 88, that was a different time and a different place. That leaders could change, countries could change, that you could be tough, but still also reach out. That you could be firm in calling out aggressive bad behavior and mistreatment of people, mistreatment of citizens, mistreatment of countries. But you could still be willing to reach out and conduct diplomacy and form relationships. That's such an important lesson for us to teach our students. It's such an important lesson. We don't get to control the world. Reagan did not end the Cold War, but Reagan was attentive to the changes in the Soviet Union and willing to work with those who were trying to change the circumstances to nudge them in a direction. Uh, as we're fighting a virtual war, and hopefully it remains virtual with Vladimir Putin, it's not virtual for the Ukrainians, we need to do everything to stop, everything we can to stop his aggression. And so far we've been somewhat successful, I think. Um, we need to stop his aggression, but we also need to be willing to reach out to, maybe not him, but others who can come after and rebuild relationships. Uh, warfare and diplomacy, conflict and cooperation, they go hand in hand. Uh, and that's one of the lessons from Reagan's time. And the evil empire speech shows us both sides of that. It shows us sometimes the excessive zeal to call out 
the bad behavior. But it also reminds us that that can't be an excuse for abandoning diplomacy and negotiation. Force and negotiation go hand in hand. Moral righteousness and compromise go hand in hand. And that's the successful story of the end of the Cold War that maybe the speech gives us at least some, some way to begin to look into uh, as, we, as our students struggle to be morally self-righteous, we hope, but also pragmatic and effective in, in trying to actually get stuff done. So I will stop there.